Hey, how are you? It's Dr. Pierce again from Michigan Sports and Spine. Week five, uh, the pandemic has changed our practice to the point that I'm going Facebook Live, Instagram, and everything. I'm a major social media guy now. That's technically not true. But the good news is, is I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the patients, and that's why we continue to do this, that they have access to me that they don't normally do. They get to see another side of me. When we were on the radio, we didn't always have our personalities out like that, but I also have support staff on the radio, and now we're just uh, running with myself and the skeleton behind me. So I try to make a little jokes, make it light, but in the big picture, we're just trying to get it, the right message out and the philosophy that we do have and we've been successful with at Michigan Sports and Spine. So Nicole says the questions are picking up. Last week, we actually got more people watching than ever. So each week it's growing. So in our humble little way, it says we, we must be helping because it's starting to spread. And a lot of patients, when I talk through the week, it's referring to our Facebook Live and now our Instagram, which has been beneficial in getting out to more of the public. Um, so it's encouraging. But the big thing is, is I want to be able to be at least productive for you and be able to answer questions that you truly have that I don't necessarily answer when you're visiting or doing um, you know, our telemedicine program. Um, I will get to the telemedicine, but just uh, Nicole's telling me, let's get going here. Um, the first question comes from someone that didn't name themselves, but says, I don't have any existing injuries, but I'm a little nervous about going back to full-time work. Do you have any tips or suggestions for maintaining proper body mechanics when returning to work? So this is something we talked about, I think in the second week that I was doing this, is that I'm very concerned about this. Even for the healthy people, which this is a great example of, is that you're, you're used to, if you're doing a job even for a year or 20 years, your body has something called, we call muscle memory. And when you have muscle memory, your body is used and conditioned for doing that job. Now, say you've been off for three months, like sometimes you'll take a vacation, that's maybe a week, maybe two weeks at most if you've got a lucky employer. But when you're now three months off and your body's used to, you know, I, I think I used a, an example of a hairstylist before. They're standing on their feet all day. They're using a lot of muscles in the upper extremities, a lot of the arm work, a lot of posturing, and a lot of awkward positions. And when you stop doing that, we have like an infrastructure of your shoulders and your upper neck and your, your trapezius muscles, your, your trap muscles, um, and your lats. So your lats are down in your chest area. All this stuff has to stay in condition. So when they ask me, how do I work on maintaining proper body mechanics? In certain areas like that, it's basically body awareness. So when you're talking about body mechanics, it's body awareness. So a lot of times, like if you're working at a desk, I tell people to maybe put a little bit of a mirror, you know, a four inch by four inch mirror, where you start your day, you, you look at your proper body mechanics when you set up at the computer. So when you set up at the computer, you sit up nice and tall, like I'm not doing right now. You get your feet supportive on the ground, and then you look over to the side where that mirror is, and you draw a line where your eyes are. So it's a little kind of easy, cheesy way to do it, but it gives you an idea because when you start falling down like this and sagging again, your eyes will not be at the same level of that line on the mirror. So it kind of prompts you up to get back up into your position, up on your shoulders, up on your armrests, whatever, whatever you need to do. And the proper mechanics, you know, we're talking about ergonomically correct chairs. We're talking, not everybody gets to get that. So whatever chair or whatever position, that's one way of doing it. Another way to do it, like if you are a hairstylist, you're looking in a mirror all day long, you want to look at mechanics, you want to look at your body, you want to look at your shoulders. So when you talk about proper mechanics, your shoulders need to be back, your ears need to be over your shoulders. So you don't do the peacock thing like this, where your, where your shoulders are forward like this, and you're cocking your head back up to take a look or do things like that, because then that will lead into uh, sore neck, sore shoulders, and everything else. As far as proper mechanics for your low back, which is a bigger issue, it's harder to do, and hopefully if you have good store, uh, core stabilizers, you're able to hold that position, but you wanna hold your pelvis into such, not like a pitch, you just kinda of have, it, have it at a neutral. So if this is the back of you and this is the front of your hips, your hips should be just slightly up a little bit to create that lordotic curve of your back. You always wanna have the natural lordotic curve of your back. 
The problem is it's, it's the body and spine was designed on purpose as a shock absorber. So if you're straightening your spine, if you're getting a straighter look, when you have an axial load or any pressures onto your back, like walking on a cement floor, standing on uh, floors that are not comfortable, you're going to create a lot of pressure that's not going to create, uh, it's going to be hindered by that shock absorbing ability of the spine. So it's a hard question. I'm trying to simplify it, and really it's not a simple answer. The biggest, to simplify it, one, you want to create core strength. You want to create full body uh, mechanics and strength also. So if you're deconditioned or you're someone who's like, I did this, I've done this job for 10 years, I'm going back to it, but you know, in 10 years, on an average, everybody gains five pounds. If you just kind of stay neutral, you naturally gain about five pounds a year. So if you're saying 10 years, you've been doing it for 10 years, you potentially are 50 pounds overweight. If you come back to this job three months later, you've now created a 50 pound force on muscles that may not be as conditioned as they were when you were working every day. When you work an eight hour day in a, in a job, you're really pushing to strengthen, like I said, a muscle memory pattern. And those muscles are conditioned to hold you in that pattern or, or carry out that task. Before you would hear me talk about, okay, you are working in this eight hour job and yeah, you are conditioning. But for me, I need a cross training, especially for people who have injuries. So they're like, well, I'm working all day, that's my exercise. It's true, but it's not true. In this case, we are worried about you returning to work and getting those muscles that were conditioned for it. Now you're compounding the problem. So now before where I would say, okay, you have those muscles conditioned because you're working every day, that's a given, but now you have back injuries. Now I gotta take away that you haven't been conditioning for three months, you have back issues. Now, unfortunately, which I'm very concerned about, is that people are going to have an accelerated problem with their injuries when they return to work. And believe me, I'm already seeing it. Already, I think, I forget what the day was, May 19th or May 18th, when all the big three were going back. I already have um, assembly workers calling me that they're, they're not handling it. One, because they're not conditioned. And two, they're working longer shifts. Like they said, part of the COVID um, solution was less people, longer hours, so you have less rotation of individuals. So that's actually getting into, getting into issues with um, deconditioning, overworking, overuse, and already on a, on a back that's already limited. So your number one risk factor is for back or neck injuries is a previous injury. Unfortunately, the majority of my patients already have that. So you have to be even more diligent to be aware of what you're doing. You cannot work 10 to 12, eight to 10 hours to 10 to 12 hours a day, think you're gonna stretch for 20 minutes when you get home and then everything's fine. You have to have a routine that works for you. So hopefully that answers your question in a roundabout oh, direct way. Um, question two, what are some of the common do's and don'ts for managing my pain? Mostly low back. So I kind of mentioned these things in the first question is that you have to stay, you have to stay active. You have to understand your core musculature. You have to understand your posture. You have to have posture awareness. You don't slouch in your chair. You sit upright. Every chance you get, your shoulders are back, your head is up, your, your pelvis again is slightly tipped, and you, and you want to strengthen up. When we talk about the low back, you're talking about core muscles, which are Again, your, paraspi your paraspinal muscles, which are either side of your spine, your abdominal muscles. Again, I pushed last week. That's very important. When you understand your core muscles, you take your belly button and you go down to your pubic bone where your privates are. That is where the difficult parts of, of your core musculature is. It's hard to work it. I've been through this. I've been on the uh, computers and phones and watching these apps and these, these suggested things. There's a lot of routine exercises being shown out there to work the lower abs because it's such a problem. And it's difficult. Um, these people, these young people that are doing it are making it look easy. I know all my patients would have a very hard time with it because I would have a hard time with it also. So what we need to do is kind of correlate the lower abs in a simpler form, which many programs are out there. If you do have a problem with it, you can call us or contact us and we'll try to work with you. The thing is with some of these programs that are on the apps or on the Instagrams or download this, download that, they're mostly dealing with healthy individuals that are just not in condition. You have to go to um, apps that are 
kind of more specific to back injuries. Because when your back is injured, obviously there's something wrong with the infrastructure and you have a problem. So the big thing is, is basically my do's and, and don'ts. You know, we, we don't want to focus on the medication. You've heard me talk about this a lot, about potentially enabling you with the wrong medication. Everybody's, you know, a big thing's going on in the media. Granted, it's being overtaken by the current things going on. But before this, we talked about the opioid epide uh, epidemic. The opioid epidemic is real. The thing is, is that as physicians, we're part of the issue if we're not recognizing the patient. So even today, I just, you know, I'm going through patients. We need to lower the amount. We need you to do your exercises. We need to do the things that are difficult. And nobody likes to do the things that are difficult, but if you're looking at a long-term solution, it's not, it's 100% not going through medications and narcotics. It's about rebuilding your infrastructure. The medications can easily be used to get you through that hump, that period of time when it can be anywhere from two weeks to six to 10 months, depending on what your situation is. But ideally it's that two week period we're all striving for. Now, if you have chronic issues and you have a low back pain that potentially failed, then you know that's, you fall into a different category. But if we take out majority of the people that have, I have back pain, and I didn't have surgery, I didn't have a major herniation, they've almost become dependent on the medication because I'm not gonna say it, but I'll say it, that you might not have seen the right person to begin with. When you're not seeing the right person that has the proper tools, it's just like anybody working on your house. You can't have a certain a plumber do the electrical. You have to have a person that understands and has the correct tools to treat you. And therefore you're not snowballing in the wrong direction, which, you know, I've been in practice 20 plus years and I'm telling you every week, if not multiple people every week, come in where they just got misdirected. I'm not saying misinformed or treated incorrectly. It's just when you have someone that has the tools, I'm not looking to do heart surgery. I'm not looking to cure cancer. I know where, you know, like the old statement, you gotta stay within your lines that you know. The thing is, is that we're putting together physicians of like-minded where we're very good understanding the box of, of the majority of issues, but not everybody falls into that box. A lot of people will fall slightly out. So when I say I put together a team that works with me, it's like we have a clear understanding of how to understand the mechanism of the injury, but sometimes you gotta be a little bit creative or have a better understanding of alternative treatments. You know, like the use of acupuncture, the use of chiropractic, when you should be using it. When we should be doing injections, what you know, what type of therapist should be seeing? Not every physical therapist is the same. It's definitely not true. Just like not every chiropractor, not everybody is the same. So you need to, you need to kind of push in a person that you have confidence in. You know, if it's me or if it's someone else in our field, whatever it is, it's you know, from the orthopedic surgeon, you got to have confidence and study them and and understand, or you trust the physician that's sending them, which we do. We have a team of physicians that I have a lot of confidence in when we refer. So a program like this, it's seasoned, you know, we're not, you know, when I started off young, it was like I had to prove myself. You know, these were my credentials. This is how hard I worked. I always worked hard to do it. Now I have the 20 plus years experience. I've seen a lot of things and we're, you know, we're trying not to make any mistakes along the way, but obviously we will, but we don't do it intently. And we work as hard to put you with the right, the right person that fits your issue. So the biggest thing we do is customize um, what we need to do for you. Um, so question three, how would you say you're different from other PM&R docs? I should have left half of this answer for that. So we talked about it briefly. I mean, you know, I always like, I do a lot of training. I have a, someone who trains under me every year and then we have residents and st medical students and interns and all that. The biggest thing, if you're going into my specialty, I always state that it's easy to become a uh, physical medicine rehabilitation doctor. It's very hard to be a good one because there's so many levels of, of what we do. Fortunately, early on, I, my passion was to get into the sports and with the, inter, uh, the entertainers and the athletes. And fortunately, I was able to do that at the highest end in, in the Detroit area. I got to work with some of the biggest Red Wings and, and, and everyone else. Um, so that that puts you at a level, a whole different level when you're dealing with an athlete. When you're dealing with an athlete who's getting paid, their life depends on it. I mean, not that a line worker or anyone else is any different, 
but that's you know what we feel in our field is the pinnacle of, of who we can treat. And fortunately, I've had good fortune with a lot of them, and, and I've been recognized, you know, in, in multiple literatures and things like that. But what what the goal is is you you want someone that knows what they're doing. You want someone who says they're sports medicine. Back when I started, I was on the ice, I was on the field, I was in the locker rooms, I was doing all that very early on to the point that it upset me when other doctors said, oh, I'm sports medicine, but they never saw a field, they never knew what a train, you know, never worked with a trainer. You, you want somebody with that experience, but it's also the person that wants to commit at that level. I gave up many hours with family to be on that field, to be there with the team, I traveled with the team. You know, those are sacrifices you do that, you know, hopefully aren't forgotten. And only now do I talk about it. I mean, I've dealt with, like I said, every entertainer there is, every uh, athlete there is here. Um, and, you know, and I've been respected to continue to work at that level. And it doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come like you just hang a shingle or you put on a YouTube video that I, I do sports medicine and things like that. I mean, I have uh, trainers to call me from California to get advice because he met me during one of the concerts because he was the trainer for one of the uh, major acts that came through here at Little Caesars. I mean, that's the respect we get. I get calls from Arizona, from California. So it, it's not, you know, I, I'm going off a little bit too much on me, but when you ask what, you know, what makes me different, it's that stuff. It's the stuff of, of working 70, 80 hours when I first started and working hard and, and taking on that extra patient instead of going home. You know, that increased my education, that increased my experience, but more importantly, it showed the passion that I had to become the best I could be at the highest level I could be. And I'm not gonna tell you I'm perfect and I make mistakes, but you know, I, I'm working hard not to make a mistake. I'm passionate about people. You'll hear with some of my patients, I want to get you better. I feel terrible, I have failed. Um, I put that on me. Um, and I try to be very difficult with patients, but again, uh, you've heard me say this before, you may hate me at the beginning, but hopefully you like me in six months. So, you know, again, the simple thing is, is I, I try to work hard, I try to be different. When you pick either a physician or a PM&R doctor, if you're not in our area, you need to look at their credentials. You need to look where they, not just when they're educated, but how much work they've done uh, you know, above and beyond. And that, that's really made the difference. Um, so again, we work hard to get the proper diagnosis. Not everybody's the same. Again, we work in a very small window because of my subspecialty. Um, there's only so many ways you've injured your back. Um, it's very rare that it's, you know, we, we haven't seen it. When we haven't seen it, it means something, what we call a zebra is going on. And unfortunately we've diagnosed, you know, cancers and things like that just because it didn't smell like what we typically see. So that, that's another big reason to go to someone who's so experienced that you're not missing the things that fall outside of our window. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't like the cancer diagnosis. We don't like you know, fractures. We don't like you know, other medical issues that are not necessarily falling in our field, but you have to recognize it. And, and to be honest, the biggest reason I've done it is because I, I did, um, we, we found something probably three months later than I wanted to. And that was just early on in my career. So it's made, in the back of my head, it's always sitting there. So we need, we need to do the full, the full workup. Um, so you, you definitely want to see someone who's comfortable with that. It's not just, this is the three things I do and I don't understand the rest. So this question comes from a personal friend of mine who's been a difficult patient, um, which most, that's why they tell you not to take care of friends and family. But it's, what is the proper therapy for concussion? Unfortunately, my friend was in a rollover accident um, and uh, very close to me, and he was fine for the first 24 hours and developed a very bad concussion over the next 72. Um, he fortunately is doing well. He's not understanding why the headaches form and what's happening and, and things like that. And, you know, it, it goes to my daughter, too, who fell off a horse. Uh, she had, that was her third concussion. So we've had, I've had personal experience, but more importantly, we, we're the ones who started the early protocols, at least in this area, for, because I do so much hockey. Um, you know, I was with all the AAA teams uh, back in the day. I was in the locker room, you know, I was at the show on the ice with these guys, that was fun. 
But the thing is, in hockey back in the day, you know, before all these protocols, we had to develop our own protocol. How about returning to the ice? Because back then you had to fight more with the coach and you had to fight more with the parents. You had to fight more with the, with the injured athlete. So we've had protocols where, you know, you have to be, you can't be light sense. All the easy ones, light sense, he headaches, difficult concentrating. Usually when you're at the hard part of the protocol, those are done. Now you're worried about recurrence. You're worried about increasing their heart rate. So the biggest thing that goes on now is that if you're symptom free before we put you back in um, on the ice or whatever sport or whatever game you're doing, we have to max you out because you want to tax the body because that's where the, the, the limitations come from, where the injuries come from is when you tax the body at such a high level. And when you tax it, we do it at a hundred to two hundred percent of your heart rate. So if you're resting heart rate on a good athlete somewhere around sixty, we want to get their heart rate somewhere between one fifty and one eighty to really tell if they're if they're not having symptoms. Because a lot of symptoms, which one of my biggest issues is I had a kid from Alaska playing here. So he committed his whole year to play, he was seventeen years old came here to play from Alaska from one of the top AAA, AAA teams here locally. And he had a major concussion. And the thing was, is we, we got him through the protocols, we got him symptom free, but we could not get him back to symptom free at a high level. It came out later that he had to give up hockey, but he also came out later, they didn't tell me they had three concussions before he even got here. So by current protocols, this is 10 plus years ago, current protocols, if you're having that, you're automatically sitting for, for a year if you're at your third concussion, major concussion. So there, there is issues with my friend personally. You know, it, it doesn't have to be your heart rate on a treadmill. It can be anxiety. It can be stress. Everybody's under a lot of stress right now. That changes your blood pressure, increases your heart rate. What that does is compromise the blood supply to your brain, and then you're having more symptoms. So... In his case, he's having headaches, which he can't explain because he's doing his normal routine work, which if you're a multitasker and you're able to do multiple things and you're computing, you know, your cognitive level is at a higher level, it creates a frustration. So when you create a frustration, you get a snowball effect on yourself. So you have to take a step back. You have to realize that you have a concussion, that things have to be, you know, if you're used to doing three, four things at a time, you have to do one, or one thing at a time. You have to simplify, you have to relax your body, you have to meditate, whatever thing it is that you need to do, you have to find it then. So concussion protocols, the easy ones that everybody knows, oh, the light bothers me, I can't concentrate, I can't sleep, I can't, you know, I've I got issues with my vision. Those are the easy ones. You obviously have a concussion. Where it gets real difficult is the when you have no headaches, symptoms are less, but your concentration isn't there. That phone number you used to know it doesn't come off real quick. You're in multiplication, uh, remembering the routine. Like I do, in the morning you do, I, I get up, I shower, I brush my teeth, I shave, and then you kind of forget which came first. Those are little symptoms of, you know, we call it the aging symptom, but when you're relative to concussion, it's very similar. So it is a hard question. It's, you know, there's a lot of protocols. There's way more awareness. Uh, we were one of the first ones to create the, the uh, protocols here locally for our hockey players, uh, which we still use today. So hopefully, I think the world is more educated and more understanding, not forcing kids back on the field prematurely. Um, ideal summer, uh, full body workout. So everybody knows if you've been listening and watching, I'm big on biking. Um, I'm excited because I, I got a new kayak and I'm going to be kayaking again. So really my routine typically is for my upper body is I'm working, I'm working on kayaking. So hopefully get my arms and chest back into shape, but also the cardio work there, but also the biking. So the simple answer is, and Nicole's laughing at me. Show me the weights. <laughs> oh, I got weights back here too. Nicole uh, played a game with me yesterday. She, she encouraged me to lift them and then she started videotaping me without me knowing. So I think that's out on Instagram and hopefully you all get a few laughs at it because it, I did and I, I don't look my best. So I'm, I'm hoping that I get a repeat in a couple months and I, I will look a little bit more fit than I did. And I'm going to shoot her for putting that out there because she wouldn't allow me to put it out there. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping this is helpful on a serious note. 
Um, we are here to help. I know everybody's going through a lot of stress. You know, I'm getting I'm getting calls from people. You know, you know it, it's getting to be sad, um, sad situations, and a lot of a lot of confusion for all ages right now, all colors, all mix, er, everyone. And you know, like the comedian, I, I was watching. I watch comedy now to just break it all up. And the comedian says it doesn't matter. He goes, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Comedians all have to speak the same language. And I, I think that's a special way to look at it. Peace out.